can see myself also. So uh, uh, first I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to give uh, the talk at this uh, webinar. Uh, the subject is very important and the speakers are very inter interesting, so uh, thank you. I'm Rafael Vines, I'm from uh, Ariel University uh, in Israel. Uh, and I will present a work that was published recently, uh, just at the beginning of, uh, of May. Uh, the title is Targeted Antiviral uh, Treatment Using Non-Ionizing uh, Radiation Therapy for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, now, I know that uh, most of you won't remember most of my talk, so uh, I will start with the most important thing I would like you to remember from my talk. Uh, so in this, uh, in this work, the work that I will present, uh, we propose a method uh, for selective physical inactivation of uh, viruses that allows rapid uh, adaptation to new viruses. Okay, it's selective, it, it, it damages only the viruses and not the uh, cells around it. Uh, and uh, very quickly, we can uh, tune it to different uh, uh, viruses. Doesn't have to be just for corona. Uh, the treatment is designed to make patients less contagious, enhancing faster recoveries, and enabling timely control of a spreading uh, pandemic. So, uh, what was the uh, the problem that we we? Why did we start the, this research? So uh, uh, as with the corona, epidemics can start uh, suddenly and spread <clears throat> sorry, very quickly. Uh, but the process of developing a biochemical solution, uh, which is usually the solution for uh, uh, these kinds of problem, uh, like a, a vaccine or a drug, is very long and very expensive. Uh, and even after finding a vaccine or a drug, uh, the process of approving it and making it available for the public is very, very long. Uh, moreover, uh, biochemical solutions usually target uh, viral components, and sometimes the, a, a solution that was developed against the virus uh, will not necessarily be uh, effective against different uh, variants of the same virus. Uh, like what we see with the corona now, that uh, uh, we're not sure that the uh, Indian variant or the British variant or the South African variant, uh, uh, if we can use the vaccine for all these variants. In addition, uh, because viruses undergo mutations, they can develop immunity against biochemical treatments. Uh, in our research, uh, we are trying to offer a solution for this uh, problem. So uh, the research goal is to develop a treatment that allows rapid adaptation to different viruses, a treatment that is effective against all variants of the virus, and the uh, immunity cannot be developed against it. So how can we inactivate a virus other than by biochemical uh, means? So for, <clears throat> sorry, for enveloped viruses, of course, that you know that envelope viruses are viruses that are surrounded by con a continuous bilayer membrane, uh, like the coronavirus. Uh, and inside, they have the genomic uh, information. They have the DNA or RNA. Uh, they are inactivate, uh, in inactive uh, when uh, the membrane is ruptured. If the viral genomes, the, the DNA or RNA is released from the ruptured membrane, uh, it remains incapable, ca incapable of uh, infecting uh, healthy cells. Uh, and, you know, this was uh, historically demonstrated by the successful control of disease by uh, alcohol and soap. Uh, unfortunately, uh, alcohol and soap cannot be directly applied uh, within the body to inactivate the variants. Uh, so uh, we need, sorry. So how can we inactivate a virus other than by a biochemical A, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, we propose a different method for uh, rupturing the membrane. 
uh, with, uh, by uh, forced oscillations at the resonant frequency. So since resonance is very important in our method, I, I would like to expand a little on the on the subject and remind you uh, about resonance frequency. Uh, if an external force acts on a system at a frequency similar to the frequency of one of the system natural mode of oscillation, the amplitude of the movement might increase to a point where the uh, system might collapse. Uh, just like a, a shutter in a wine glass with a sound wave. Okay, so uh, let's see a, a short demonstration on, on a wine glass, and, and then we will see how we can use it for a, in our case. Can you see the the video? Can you see the video? Yes, we do. And, and do you hear the sound? Can you hear the audio also? No, we cannot uh, hear. Okay, the audio. okay. So uh, here we have a, 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 a video of a, a wine glass a, a ruptured by a, using sound waves. And just a minute. And, and it was a, a the video was taken with a very a fast. A, uh, uh, video uh, camera, and uh, so we can see it very slowly, the, the images. So you can see how the uh, movement, the, how the amplitude of the oscillation is getting bigger and bigger uh, as the sound wave uh, are reaching the, the glass. So now we can here they draw the sound waves and the blue are the sound waves and you see what happens when the uh, frequency of the sound wave is similar to the frequency of the oscillation. It, it, if the timing of the frequencies is, is, is exactly right, uh, this is what's called the resonance frequency the, it increases the, uh, the amplitude and eventually it will break, okay? Uh, so as you could see in the video, the, the external force, in this case, it was the, the sound waves, uh, they, uh, they applied, uh, the sound waves that were applied on the wine glass, they add energy to the system and increase the amplitude of the oscillation. Of course, in our case, it's, it's a bit more complicated because besides the force oscillations, uh, we have also damping forces like, like friction. Uh, but as long as the energy entering the, the system by the uh, forcing oscillation is greater than the energy leaving the system by friction, uh, the amplitude will increase. Uh, so, so we would like to use the electromagnetic radiation as the resonant frequency to rupture the membrane. So this is what we try to do. Uh, just. So when using uh, electromagnetic radiation on biological system, we must remember that the uh, uh, exposure of bio biological systems to ionizing radiation uh, can be destructive factor to the system because ionization causes severe damage to the genetic material, to the DNA, RNA uh, of the individual cells. And of course, we want to avoid harming the, the cells of the body of the patient when, when we try to inactivate the virus. Uh, therefore, we would like to use non-ionizing radiation. Now, luckily the, the viral uh, membrane and it's a core shell charge separation, present the polar mode oscillatory uh, vibrations with resonant uh, frequencies that is, are estimated to be within the non-ionizing radiation uh, bands. As you can see in the figure here in section B, uh, this is uh, oscillation mode of the core. The core moves uh, right and left uh, relative to the shell 
and this is estimated to be in a frequency that it is in the non-ionizing uh, uh, range. And given a, an appropriate forcing uh, frequency, the, the opposite crucial oscillation may result in a physical viral uh, membrane fracture, providing the effect in inactivation. Uh, so when using a, sorry. Uh, so the frequency of the dipolar mode, the, the mode that I showed you before in the figure, is expected to be in the range of uh, 3 to uh, 30 gigahertz, a range also known as the uh, super high frequency, SHF. Uh, and although the SHF, uh, the super high frequency radiation, penetrates uh, less uh, to the body compared to ionizing radiation, uh, there were some recent advances in uh, endoscopic uh, super high frequency medical devices that allow delivery of such radiation to deep tissues within the human body. Uh, now we know that coronaviruses start uh, replicating and shedding in the throat uh, even before they're reaching the lungs. So an antiviral throat uh, treatment a procedure with a, the super high frequency mediated inactivation uh, for reducing the viral loads might be very, uh, might be highly effective. So uh, in order for our method to work, we first need to calculate the resonant frequency of the dipolar mode. Uh, we also need to calculate the intensity and duration of the radiation <clears throat> Uh, that is required for effective treatment without exceeding the safety uh, standard. Now, this is a, a challenge because we need some experimental parameters that are hard to measure, like the uh, longitudinal and uh, transverse sound velocities in the uh, viral membrane, the total amount of charge, the relative permittivity, etc. Uh, so uh, our work in this article was um, theoretical, so we had to calculate the parameters uh, required by uh, solving the relevant equations uh, while making the approximation and, uh, and neglect uh, as, as needed and uh, if possible. So the paper has uh, four main equations and the complete solution for, uh, of this uh, equation you can find in the supplementary uh, data. But I'll save you all uh, the math and we'll skip straight to the results. Uh, so to calculate the resonant frequency, we use the LAMPS theory. And solving the eigenvalue uh, equation, we get that the, the frequency is proportional to the longitudinal sound velocity and inversely proportional to the diameter, meaning that uh, if the diameter is twice bigger, the uh, frequency will be twice smaller. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I see that you don't see the, the slides that I'm talking about. Uh, but even with the with the uh, equation that we calculated, uh, this proportionality, uh, but we still need the, the velocity the, of the uh, the longitudinal velocity of the sound wave uh, in order to be able to to calculate the frequency. Uh, and like I said, this is a, a, a huge challenge. So. Uh, Instead, uh, we used ex experimental measurements of uh, EV71 virus uh, to estimate the longitudinal uh, sound velocity. Uh, now, in this figure, you can uh, it presents the estimated resonant frequencies uh, for different EV71 uh, diameters and uh, uh, for uh, velocity, uh, long longitudinal uh, sound velocity 
in the range between 1800 and 3000 uh, meters uh, per second. Uh, and it's based on uh, elastic properties of, uh, of the virus. So it's all theoretical. Uh, uh, the calculated uh, resonant frequencies uh, were compared, uh, what here the, th the theory was, was compared uh, with the experimentally measured uh, resonant frequencies and uh, diameters of uh, EV71 virus. Uh, so the comparison of the calculated and measured frequencies indicates that uh, for practical approximation, uh, we can use the following equation to calculate the resonant frequency, like you see. Uh, we, we, we got that the frequency is invertly, inversely proportional to the diameter, and the proportionality constant is 1200. So now we can have a, 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 a number for a, a for the frequency, as long as we know the diameter of the, of the virus. Now, in order to, uh, uh, to, to test our estimation, we compared the experimental results uh, of another type of uh, virus. We took the results, uh, the experimental results for influenza A, and we compared it to, the, to our uh, theory. Uh, and uh, we, we saw that we have a very high co uh, correlation. So we were very encouraged that uh, our calculations were correct. Uh, so all that we need now is to measure the coronavirus diameter, which was already done by uh, two groups, by Scheller et al. and Prasad et al. Uh, and by the way, a very important uh, finding that we discovered was that the uh, the correlation between the theory and the experimental measurements exists only uh, for diameter uh, measurements uh, that were made using uh, electron, uh, electron microscopy, whereas a hydrodynamic diameter measurement did not correlate with the theory. So uh, it's more so we used only the electron electron microscopy uh, measurement. So using a, a, the electron mic a microscopy diameter measurements uh, of the coronavirus, we, we were able to calculate the resonant frequency and we found it to be uh, within uh, 8.5 to 20 gigahertz with absorption peak or within uh, 15 to 17 uh, gigahertz. Uh, uh, now, uh, in, uh, besides the frequency, we needed also to calculate the, uh, the intensity uh, needed in order to, inact to inactivate uh, the virus. So for that, we needed to first to calculate the threshold electric field magnitude to inactivate the coronavirus uh, particles. And for that, we needed, uh, again, to have some experimental parameters, such as the reduced mass and the threshold stress uh, to fracture the membrane. Uh, for the reduced mass, we used uh, uh, the ex experimental measurement done by uh, Baron et al. But for the other parameters, uh, we couldn't find uh, any uh, experimental measurements. So uh, uh, given the, the genomic similarity and the fact that uh, viral shell uh, derive uh, typically from uh, the, host the host cell membrane portions, uh, so for the other parameters, we use the experimental parameters uh, measured for influenza A. So using all these uh, values, we estimate the threshold electric field magnitude to cause a coronavirus uh, particles inactivation to be a 1.5 uh, watts per uh, square meter. And of course, this is at the, uh, the range of between 10 to 17 gigahertz. Uh, for, uh, for influenza A, uh, irradiation of uh, around the 10 to the 15 
uh, virus particles uh, per, per cubic meter at the threshold intensity uh, for an exposure of 15 minutes, it corresponded to uh, about 38% of uh, inactivation. In order to uh, inactivate 100%, the intensity had to be 10 times higher. So we took this uh, ratio uh, in order to estimate the intensity needed to inactivate 100% of the same number of, uh, uh, of the same density of corona uh, part virus particles. And based on that, we estimated that a simultaneous uh, 10 to 17 gigahertz by irradiation for a, about 15 minutes ex exposure at a 14.5 watts per square meter intensity can provide 100% inactivation uh, of around the, uh, of a density of 10 to the 15 uh, virus part, coronavirus particles per, per cubic meter. And uh, uh, it's important that uh, this intensity is much below the maximum perm uh, permissible intensity under the safety regulations, which is uh, 200 uh, watts per square meter in the range of uh, electromagnetic, uh, in this uh, range of uh, electromagnetic radiation. So we're using 14.5 and the maximum is a, a, a 200 watts per square meter. So we, we're much below. Uh, okay, uh, now the number that we calculated before was for a, a specific density of a, a viral particles. Uh, but uh, uh, we, knowing that the, the density of the viral particle, uh, if, if we know uh, the density of the viral particles in the treated tissue, we will be able to, uh, to use that uh, to tailor the treatment for the specific, specific patient. Uh, based on the viral particle density, uh, the duration of uh, the irradiation may need to be reduced or extended. Uh, so, uh, but how can we estimate the, the density of the, uh, of the, viral, uh, the viral density in the patient? So for that, we used the equation that you can see on the slide, where uh, Y is the throat swab uh, cycle threshold uh, value, and X is the log of the number of uh, viral particles. So using that, we can uh, uh, conclude that uh, if we have a, 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 a we can uh, have a patient-specific ex exposure duration uh, of the uh, <clears throat> non-ionizing radiation that we use, uh, and we can derive the duration by following the, the above equa equation. We take 15 minutes and we multiply it by the uh, ratio of the patient's viral density uh, with the reference density. The reference density is the 7.5, 10 to the 14 uh, particle per uh, cubic uh, meter. So to conclude, uh, uh, the greatest advantage of, of the method we, we have presented is its flexibility and the ability to adapt it quickly to treat, uh, to treat new viruses. The method is in effect, is effective to all variants of the virus and, and the virus cannot develop immunity against the, the treatment. Uh, in addition, the, the method also can, uh, can be used uh, for air pur uh, purification, for uh, sanitation of, uh, of surfaces like sanitizing public spaces or or healthcare center, et cetera. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, looking forward, <clears throat> uh, the work we performed was a, a theoretical, even though there was some, uh, it was based on, a, in part, on a experimental results uh, in other viruses. Uh, but we are now trying to confirm our theory with the help of, of uh, some experiments. 
We are working now on uh, building a source that can uh, radiate uh, the desired uh, range. And once we'll have the source, uh, we plan to test our method on, uh, on liposomes. Uh, uh, liposomes are artici artificial membranes uh, of different sizes and to see if, if we can, uh, uh, the theory that uh, we develop uh, fits the, the results that we'll get on uh, liposomes. And, and also we would like to further expand the, the use of this method to other viruses like, uh, like herpes virus to calculate the frequency needed in order to fracture the herpes virus and uh, uh, to do some experiment to see if, if we, we are able to do that. Uh, now, uh, all, all the work that I uh, presented to you was uh, done by an amazing PhD student that I have, uh, Ian Barbora, uh, and he did uh, most of the, uh, the work and uh, most of the, uh, he wrote the paper. And uh, I'm just presenting uh, his work. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I'm open for questions. Now the session is open for questions. If anyone had any questions, please drop your questions in the chat. Uh, hello, doctor. There's a question for you in the chat box. Uh, it's it's not a program. It's just a, you can see all the uh, it's just equation that we saw. So you can see all the equations in the in the paper itself, and in the supplementary data you can see all the solution of the equations. So you can just take this uh, equation and apply them. Once you know the diameter of the virus that you want to treat, you can take the diameter and, and uh, put it, use the equation that we have in order to uh, calculate for the uh, to, to calculate the frequency in order to treat it. Any other question? Anyone questions? Now the session is open for questions. If anyone had any questions, please unmute your audio or else drop